Man's Deification Part 2 Partakers of the Divine Nature By His Holiness Pope Shenouda III The expression, partakers of the divine nature, was it God's will, that since the time he created us, to deify us? Did the Lord Christ deify his human nature? Do we partake of the divine nature through adoption? Is the resurrection of the dead considered partaking of the divine nature? Do we partake of the divine nature through the Eucharist? Did God become man so that man may become God? Does the partaking of the divinity appear in the authority over the devils? Is holiness considered partaking of the Holy Trinity? Is the hypostatic descending of the Holy Spirit considered deification? Is grace considered partaking of the divine nature? Introduction In continuation of our previous book on man's deification, we published the present book on the same topic under the title, Partaking of the Divine Nature. In this book, we shall refute such a thought represented in a doctrine published by Dr. George Habib Bebawi in his book, St. Athanasius the Apostolic, as well as in another book by some monks of Amba Makar, St. Macarius, Monastery under the name, The Orthodox Patristic Principles, Part 2. Both are two branches of one school that translated the words of St. Peter the Apostle, partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4, to mean taking the same divine nature, not merely acting and willing in conformity with the divine nature, for instance. 1. The expression partakers of the divine nature. Dr. George Habib Bibawi, in his book, St. Athanasius, mentions this phrase in the titles of chapters 8, 11, 12, 13, 14, and in the passage on partaking of the Eucharist, page 214, with the details related thereto. In page 214, he says, The fact of our partaking of the divinity is due to our receiving the holy sacrament giving the eternal life. In page 138, he says, that we may be able to partake of the divinity of the world. How bold are the words. In page 159, he says, the connection between the word incarnate and those whose nature he has partaken, that they may partake of his divinity. In his book on Orthodox Patristic Principles, part two, the author mentions the phrase, partaking of the divine nature in pages 11, 12, 35, and 45, and in page 10, he mentions our partaking of God, and our partaking of the nature of the Trinity. Again, in page 11, he speaks about the grace of deification in Christ, and in page 12, about partaking of the nature of the Godhead. We cannot accept to partake of God's nature and divinity. Whatever justification may be present by meanings and quotations, I wonder what can they say in this respect. 2. Was it God's will, since the time he created us, to deify us? They say that man's deification was the divine purpose from the very beginning, meaning that God intended from the beginning to deify man. But when man sinned, that came to naught. This thought is of course unacceptable for the following reasons. 1. Had it been God's purpose from the beginning to deify man, he would not have created him mortal. For God warned man not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, otherwise he would die. Genesis 2.17 This means that man had a mortal nature, and he died in fact. 2. Had it been God's will from the beginning to deify man, he would have created him infallible, as in, not apt to sin. But actually he was, and he did fall in sin. 3. Had it been God's will to deify man, he would not have created him of dust combined with the substance, the flesh, whereas God is spirit, John 4.24. He could then have created man like angels, for they are spirits, Psalm 104. 4. Even those who were created spirits, some of them sinned. 
The words of the liturgy of St. Gregory, You have blessed my nature in you, are not to be taken as a pretext. For blessing the nature is one thing, and deifying it is another different thing. So God has blessed our nature, but did not deify it. 3. Did the Lord Christ deify his human nature? So many are the phrases in the book of Dr. George Babawi about deifying the human nature and the flesh. In page 137, he says, The rising of the body is deification of the human nature. And in page 133, he says, Christ deified his body after death. He deified the body and made it immortal. Again, in page 134, he says, the deification of the body of Christ means making it immortal. And in page 214, he says, the human nature that has been deified through the union. He also declares that the ascension of Christ is deification of his human nature, page 134. But it is evident that the Lord Christ took a mortal body and died. In his book, Orthodox Patristic Principles, Part 2, the author repeats the same idea about deification of the body of the Lord Christ, pages 59 through 70, under many titles reading, Deification of the Human Nature of the Lord Christ. We believe that the divine nature of the Lord Christ was united with his human nature, without transformation, meaning that neither the divine nature became a human nature, nor the human nature a divine nature. If that had happened, one of the two natures would have vanished. The human nature continued human and was not transformed into a divine nature, but it became glorified. So the Lord Christ arose by the power of his divinity and ascended unto heaven by the power of his divinity, not because the human nature was transformed into a divine nature. The human nature was glorified and transfigured in the resurrection and the ascension. More serious still is that in proclaiming the deification of the body of Christ, they say, The body which the Lord took from the Theotokos is our body. Page 22. 4. Do we partake of the divine nature through adoption? In the book, Orthodox Patristic Principles, Part 2, page 25, the author says, It was Christ who said to the Father, Abba, Mark 14, 36. How then could our relationship with him be metaphorical or symbolic and we cry out with the same words? How could we speak things we do not own nor granted? But the true Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, being the Son of the Father, has taken what is ours and given us what belongs to himself, which is the praise song and doxology of the church. He gave us to partake of his sonship. Our answer to this is that there is an essential difference between Christ's sonship to the Father and our sonship to the Father. That is why the Lord Christ is called the only begotten Son. John 1, 18, 3, 16, 18. 1 John 4, 9 because he is the only begotten of the Father's essence and nature. We, on the other hand, are children through adoption, by grace, and great is the difference between adoption and sonship. We are children through faith, as the scripture says, but as many received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. John 1.18 we also are children by love, as the Apostle says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we shall be called children of God. 1 John 3, 1 We have received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Romans eight fifteen. We are not like him, and will never be. He gave us a different sonship to the Father. He is a son by nature, whereas we are children by adoption, and adoption can never bring us up into deification. We can never be equal to his son. We can only be confirmed to the image of his son, Romans 8.29. We are created, but he is eternal. 
the created can never be deified, and the sonship given us is external, outside our nature. Again, in the book entitled Athanasius the Apostolic by Dr. George Bebawi, page 134, the following is stated. The partaking of the divine nature is the obtaining of the gift of adoption through the Son. To deny this means an express return to Judaism. On our part, we do not deny adoption, but rather believe in it. We only refuse to say that adoption is a sign of partaking of the divine nature, or, in other words, that we are deified by adoption. Judaism also does not deny adoption at all. We read about Adam that he is the son of God, Luke 3.38, and the offspring of Seth and Enosh were called sons of God as mentioned in the beginning of the story about the great flood. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, Genesis 6.2. God even did not take away the name children from those who disobeyed him. For in the beginning of the prophecy of Isaiah, he said, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Isaiah 1, 2. Isaiah himself testified, saying, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. Isaiah 64, 8. Since sonship to God is known from the olden times, we cannot say that denial of adoption is returned to Judaism. For St. Paul the Apostle says about the Jews, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, Romans 9.4. There is no relationship at all between adoption and deification. We say to God, O our Father, and at the same time we say to Him, We are your servants and your creation, but we never say we are God's. On the last day, the Lord will say to every wise and faithful steward of his stewards, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few. I made you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew 25, 21 It is clear although the steward is good and faithful, he is still a servant, and his reward is to enter into the joy of his Lord without himself becoming a lord or a god, as in, without being deified. Therefore, children, be humble, and for the salvation of your souls, I say to you, do not be deified. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. Romans 12, 3. 5. Is the resurrection of the dead considered partaking of the divine nature? The resurrection of the Lord Christ is an evidence of his divinity, because he alone arose by his own will and by his own power, not by the power of anyone else. All those who arose from the dead arose by an external power. Likewise, the resurrection on the last day will be by a miracle from God himself. It is not at all an evidence of the deification of those who will be raised by the Lord. However, Dr. George Babawi is of the opinion that the resurrection is a partaking of the Godhead. In his book on St. Athanasius, page 216, Dr. George Babawi says, Partaking of the divine nature means partaking of eternal life and incorruption. This is partaking of the divine nature, for it is partaking of Christ the risen from the dead. He further says, It is partaking of the Godhead. For eternal life is the life of God himself. Almost the same expressions are included in the book Orthodox Patristic Principles, Part 2. In page 46, the author says, Eternal life is the life of God himself, and our partaking of this life is partaking of God himself, according to the words of John the Apostle. And also in the same book, Eternal life is the life of God himself. And if this is not partaking of the nature of God, what can it be? These words mean that partaking of eternal life is partaking of the nature of God, that is, a kind of deification. Again, in page 58 of the same book, we read, In order that man may be granted to continue in immortality through the partaking of the Godhead. 
Our answer to those who hold this view is that the life of God is of his very nature, but our life is a gift from God by his grace. Therefore, we should not take the gift as an evidence of deification. We say in the Holy Liturgy, He granted us eternal life, and it is evident that those who are granted eternal life were, before the resurrection, dead, and death certainly contradicts deification. Also, the Lord Christ says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 54 This eternal life, then, is a gift from God. Furthermore, the righteous who rise from the dead will dwell with God in the heavenly Jerusalem, the tabernacle of God with men. Revelation 21, 3 Of course God will not dwell with gods, for after the resurrection they will continue as human beings, men, as they were on earth. In page 137 of the same book, they say that the resurrection of Christ is deification of human nature. This view is theologically unacceptable. The human nature will continue a human nature after the resurrection. The Lord Christ, after his resurrection, kept the name, the Son of Man, as Stephen the deacon saw him while he was stoned, Acts 7.56, and as John the Beloved saw him in the Revelation, Revelation 1.13. Moreover, the deification of the man nature means that it is vanished, which is against faith. 6. Does the partaking of the divinity appear in the authority over the devils? This verse is clear in the book of Dr. George Babawi, page 137, where he says, The partaking of the divine nature appears clear in man's authority over the devil, and in heaven in the life of of incorruption. We say that overcoming the devil is a gift from God, Matthew 10, 1, not deification of man. It is clear from the book of Revelation that Archangel Michael prevailed over the devil and cast him out to the earth, Revelations 12, 7 through 9. Can we take this as an evidence for, of the deification of Archangel Michael as well? Actually, So many saints prevailed over the devils, and many had the gift of casting out devils. Have all of them been deified? Prevailing over the devil can be realized through humbleness, not by deification. 7. Do we partake of the divine nature through the Eucharist? Dr. George Babawi, in his book, St. Athanasius, page 214, under the title, Partaking of the Eucharist is partaking of the divine nature, says, Our real partaking of the divinity is due to our obtaining the heavenly sacrament giving eternal life. In page 216, he further says, Here, the partaking of the divine nature attains its goal for man, that is obtaining the immortal divine heavenly mysteries. In his book, Orthodox Patristic Principles, Part 2, page 24, The author says, Wonderful! Behold, we drink the divinity, mystically of course, and we drink the life-giving blood according to the grace. It is strange indeed. The divinity is not eaten or drunk. The divine mysteries in the sacrament of the Eucharist are not given to us that we may partake of the divinity, God forbid. They are given as salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life to whoever partakes of them, and also as purity of our souls, our bodies, and our spirits. As we say in the Holy Liturgy, if the partaker eats and drinks the divinity, no doubt the partaker becomes a god, and ought not to worship the holy sacraments, but the people ought to worship him. If they say that there is a union between the divine nature and the human nature, this does not mean that man eats the divinity. We have an example from the scriptures. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17 11, 14. Whoever eats or drinks the blood does not eat the life with it. 8. Did God become man so that man may become God? If these words were taken literally, the purpose of the incarnation would be the deification of man. 
but it is well known that God became a man to redeem man, not to deify him. This is clearly evident in the book of St. Athanasius, the incarnation of the world, and in the words of the apostle about the Father that he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, and also the words in the Gospel of St. John, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 The purpose, then, was the salvation of man and taking away the punishment of eternal perdition. Therefore, it is better to say that God became the Son of man so that man may become the Son of God, and that the main reason for the Incarnation continues to be the redemption. It should also be understood that man's sonship to God is different from Christ's sonship to God. The Union Between the Divine Nature and the Human Nature Preface Some of those who proclaim deification of man do not understand properly the union between the divine nature and human nature in the incarnation of the Lord Christ. Glory be to him. Therefore, I wrote this article to expound this fact to them, and also lest they be wise in their own sight. We all believe in the union between the divine nature and the human nature, a union without separation for a single moment or a twinkling of an eye. We believe that this union is without mixing, blending, or change. What do the words without change mean? They mean that the divine nature was not changed or transformed into a human nature, but the divine nature maintained all its qualities and attributes, and the human nature likewise did not change or become a divine nature. We shall give here various examples clarifying this point. In spite of the unity between the divine nature and the human nature in the incarnation of the Lord Christ, we notice several things. The divinity does not grow or become stronger. The divinity does not move from one place to another. The divinity does not ascend unto heaven or descend unto earth. The divinity does not sleep or slumber. The divinity does not get tired or suffer pain. The divinity does not hunger or thirst. The divinity does not die. The divinity cannot be eaten or drunk. Introduction In the union between divine nature and the human nature in the incarnation of the Lord Christ, we notice that the union did not abolish at all the attributes of the divinity, but they continued. We nevertheless confess that the divinity of the Lord Christ was not separated from his humanity, not even for a single moment or a twinkling of the eye. This is the teaching of the great Saint Cyril, the pillar of faith. 1. It is said that the human nature of Christ did not grow. That is said about the Lord Christ in his childhood. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Luke 2.52 It is also said, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2.40 Yes, he grew in the body, that is, in the human nature, but it is impossible that the divine nature grows, because in divinity he is in complete perfection, or absolute perfection, always. The divine nature is united to the human nature without separation, even for a single moment. However, the human nature grows, but the divine nature does not grow, because the divinity is characterized by not growing. But let not anyone in ignorance think, that the difference between the divine nature and the human nature in this respect means a separation between both the two natures. 2. It is said about the Lord Christ that he came in the world in this body and departed it in the body. The Lord Christ said to his disciples, I come forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. John 16:28. Of course, the words, I have come into the world, are said about the human nature only. But as concerns the divine nature, we read that he was in the world, and the world was made through him. John 1.10 And the same theological concept applies to the words, I leave the world. The Lord Christ said them about the body. But as concerns the divinity, he said, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28:20, 20, and also, 
Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Matthew 18.20 So there is no contradiction between the words, I leave the world, and the words, Lo, I am with you, I am there in the midst of them. One was said about the human nature, and the other about the divine nature, without any separation between both natures. Beware then, my children, for the Lord Christ says, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures. Matthew 22, 29. 3. It is said that the Lord Christ ascended unto heaven in the body. This is what we say in the liturgy of St. Gregory, upon your ascension unto heaven in the body. It is also said in the first chapter of the Acts that he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight, and that he was taken up unto heaven. Acts 1, 9-11. The divinity, on the other hand, does not ascend or rise up into heaven. He is present in heaven, on earth, and in between them. He does not move from one place to another because he is present everywhere at the same time. So when we say about the human nature that he ascended in the body, and about the divine nature that he does not ascend, this does not mean at all that there is a separation between both natures. No doubt when the Lord Christ ascended into heaven in the body, his divinity was united with his human nature without separation. But the ascension is ascribed to the body, that is, to the human nature only, because the ascension is not a characteristic of the divinity who is present everywhere. He who has an ear, let him hear. 4. It is said about the Lord Christ in many passages that he slept. This happened when he was in the boat, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat. He was in the stern, asleep, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Mark 4, 37, 38. The same incident is also mentioned in Luke 8, 23, 24. Undoubtedly, the sleeping was for the body, that is, for the human nature because the divinity does not sleep or slumber. Psalm 121, 4. But although the sleeping was for the body only, not for the divinity, the divinity was completely united with the human nature. An evidence is that he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the seas, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And they feared exceedingly and said to another, Who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Mark 4, 39-41 Here, the divinity is united with the human nature without separation, but the sleep and awakening are ascribed to the body, because sleep is not a characteristic of the divinity. He who has an ear, let him hear. 5. It is said about the Lord Christ that he did hunger and thirst, in his fasting for forty days on the Mount of Tribulation, he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Luke 4.2 And the same is mentioned in Matthew 4.2 When he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward, he was hungry. He hungered in the body and was tempted in the body. Although his divinity is united with the human nature, because when he rebuked Satan, saying, Away with you, Satan, Satan left him. And behold, angels came and ministered to him. Matthew 4, 10, 11. However, the hunger is ascribed to the human nature, because hunger is not a characteristic of the divinity. Moreover, that the divinity did not hunger as well, this does not mean that the divinity is separated from the human nature. The same applies to the thirst of the Lord Christ, for on the cross he said, I thirst, John 19, 28. The divinity does not hunger or thirst, and therefore does not eat or drink. But this does not mean at all that the divinity is not united with the human nature without separation for a single moment or a twinkling of an eye. The divinity has his attributes and qualities which he did not lose by being united with the human nature. 6. It is said about the Lord Christ that he was wearied. In his meeting with the Samaritan woman, it is mentioned that Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, 
John 4, 6. The divinity does not weary. No doubt, Christ wearied in the body, though the body is united with the divinity. The divinity, though united with the body, did not relieve the body from its attributes or its weaknesses. The weary, the pain, the hunger, the thirst, the need for rest and sleep, the need for eating and drinking, because he took all the characteristics of our nature except for sin. 7. It is said about the Lord Christ that he suffered. He himself said to the disciples before the crucifixion, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised the third day. Matthew 16, 21. And after this resurrection, he said to his disciples, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Luke 24, 46. Again, in the epistle to the Hebrews, we read that he suffered outside the gate. Hebrews 13, 12. And for in that he himself suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. Hebrews 2, 18. Many also are the other verses about his suffering, including striking, whipping, crucifixion, nails, thorns, and many other things as mentioned in Psalm 22, 7 through 18. In spite of all this, the divinity does not suffer. Whoever says that the divinity suffers has fallen in a heresy. In all the suffering of the Lord Christ, his divinity was united with his human nature without separation for a single moment or a twinkling of an eye. 8. Christ also died in the flesh, but the divinity never dies. Even in his death, he was united with the divinity and was never separated. In the part of the ninth hour, we address him, saying, You who tasted death in the body at the ninth hour. And in the Syrian fraction of the Holy Liturgy, we say about the death of Christ, His spirit was separated from his body, but his divinity was never separated from his spirit or his body. Death is characteristic of the human nature, not of the divine nature. But this does not mean at all that the divine nature was separated from the human nature. In spite of the union between the divine nature and the human nature, the divine nature kept the divine attributes, does not weary, does not suffer, does not die, does not grow, does not ascend, does not hunger, does not thirst, does not sleep, as we have already explained. 9. The same applies to the Eucharist sacrament. The divinity is not eaten or drunk, in spite of the union between the divine nature and the human nature. When the Lord handed the sacrament to his disciples, he said to them, Take, eat, this is my body, drink from it, and this is my blood. Matthew 26, 26 through 28. Mark 14, 22 through 24. He never said, This is my divinity. St. Paul the Apostle also said, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10, 15, 16. So, Paul taught us about the communion of the body and blood, not the communion of the divinity, as those who proclaim the deification of man say. Truly, the divine nature was not separated from his human nature, but the divinity is not eaten or drunk, for it is not characteristic of the divinity. St. Paul the Apostle also, in 1 Corinthians 11, repeated the same words of the Lord when he was handing that sacrament to his disciples. Then he said, Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. For he who eats and he who drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 29. St. Paul did not mention at all the divinity when speaking about the seriousness of partaking in an unworthy manner. He only said, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And in the Gospel of St. John, the Lord says about the sacrament, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. John 6, 55, 56 He did not say, eats and drinks my divinity. It is because the divinity is not eaten or drunk in spite of the unity between both. Do not then spread strange teachings not included in the holy scripture of the Father's sayings. The Fathers gave us as an example of the unity between the human nature and the divine nature, the unity of the heated iron with the fire, and also the unity between the spirit and the body. He who has an ear, let him hear. The words of the Lord, abide in me and I in him, do not mean abiding in his divinity. Those who ate and drank for the first time in the Lord's Supper, for instance, did not abide in him. For some were afraid and fled, and one of them denied him thrice, and all of them hid in the upper room, fleeing from the Jews. The Lord explained the words, Abide in me, and I in him. When he said to his disciples, Abide in my love, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. John 15, 9, 10 He did not speak about abiding in his divinity. My advice to you, my children, is, be humble. Do not be deified. Do not think that you have become guardians over orthodoxy or over the Father's sayings. Always remember the words of the scripture. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fault. Proverbs 16, 18 I still hold to the words of the Didascalia, remove away guilt by teaching. I still pity you, and would that you pity yourself.